Okay, Gina, if you're all ready, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Thanks for letting me know that, Sarah Beth and Sonia. Um, welcome, everyone, to this afternoon's webinar. This is Who's in Charge Here? Harnessing the Power of Homeschoolers While Fostering Relevancy with All Students. Um, my name is Charlie Taylor. I'm one of the CE consultants here at KDLA. I'm sure you all are used to hearing my voice by now. I'll be facilitating today's webinar. So if you have any technical issues um, as we go along, please feel free to chat those in. I'll do my best to help you out. And uh, if you have any questions for our presenter today, please feel free to chat those in. She's, um, in she enjoys the feedback that she gets from, from folks in the chat pod. So please feel free to chat any questions, anything like that. Um, at the end of the webinar, you'll be able to download a copy of these slides as a PDF. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this is being recorded, so you'll be able to review this or share it with your coworkers. Um, additionally, I'll be sending out another email in the next couple of days that will have um, your certificate of attendance for certification renewal as well as a link to a survey about this training. And we very much appreciate your feedback and suggestions for other trainings. And I'm a, just before I change the screen, it looks like the majority of responses for our poll are, you have some homeschoolers in your library. So nobody is saying none, so that's good. At least you've got some for everybody. So a little introduction. Our presenter today is Gina Wilson. And Gina uh, has an MLIS from the University of Alabama. She's the director of the Thomasville Public Library in Clark County, Alabama. Gina believes that the library is a great equalizer for the economically disadvantaged and rurally challenged and collaborates extensively to connect with people, connect people with the information they need. And currently she's interested in community engagement, seniors and technology, job seekers and students. And she presented this presentation at the uh, 2015 conference of the Association for Rural and Small Libraries, ARSL. Uh, that was in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. So um, if any of you were at that, uh, she was there as well. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to Gina. And Gina, please take, take the floor. OK, and thank you, Charlie. Thank you for that introduction. Um, if at any point the audio bugs out, y'all just uh, put something in chat and let, let Charlie know, and we'll see what we can do about it. Um, well, I'm ha very happy to be here today. Um, and my journey started many years ago. I actually uh, was a homeschooling parent for about 10 years. And when I re-entered the workforce, um, I, I updated some of my education. And I actually found my spot in the world, finally, uh, at, the, at the public library. And I love working at the at the library and helping uh, people to meet their information needs. Um, just a bit about my library. Um, our facility is is kind of small, not as small as some. Uh, I don't. I would like. I wish I had polls for the attendees to know what size staff you have and how big your building is. But um, but our building is 4404 square feet, and we have slightly less than four full time equivalents. Um, we have yearly visitor count approaching 46,000 a year now. So we're pretty busy. Uh, and, and the fact that we are helping people with face-to-face -face customer service, uh, especially at the computer lab, keeps us busy because that sort of customer service is pretty time intensive. And about half of my county does not have uh, internet at home, or they don't have uh, a computer at home, perhaps. So we are in the lower part of Alabama. You can see my county there. I'm just above uh, Washington and Mobile County. So if you ever go to the Gulf beaches, you'll probably be near where I'm at right now. Um, my student population is around 2,300. For this demonstration, I've broken it down to public, private, and homeschools because we're going to look at some numbers. And just looking at numbers, and you can throw numbers on a spreadsheet, and it can really kind of make things clear to you if you're, uh, you know, if you're trying to plan for services. So uh, I have been director at this library since 2007. 
uh, as I mentioned, I homeschooled for 10 years prior to becoming a librarian. Uh, and even during my homeschooling years, uh, that was just a parenting decision. It was not a criticism of the school system. And so uh, I've always tried to be very supportive uh, of the different school environments. Uh, I don't know what your experience is, but uh, when I was homeschooling, we were power users of the library, and we, we did love going to the library, um, checking out books, and uh, participating in, in any of the relevant activities that they had for, my, for the kids. Uh, we find here that the homeschoolers really like our library, and they like to come in and take advantage of some of the activities that we have. Uh, nationwide, this is a figure from 2012, and it goes up every year. Um, according to, uh, you know, we have a couple of websites, and I check them from time to time, uh, but the nces.ed.gov, that is a very reputable website and a good place to get some uh, conservative statistics about home ed education. So um, I think without a doubt we can all say that homeschoolers uh, generally love the library. Um, I checked out some things online. Um, one of the things that I run into here is that uh, especially new homeschoolers, they come in and they actually need quite a bit of help and they're told to go to the library to get help. Um, so I try to have on hand uh, a home education packet with just some information printed out for them about local support groups, where to find legal information, uh, et cetera. And then, uh, you know, we can do a library tour with them and just show them how to find materials in the library and how to use our catalog. Um, so I don't know if anybody else does anything like that, but you know, if you just put together a little Word document and you, you have it ready, you know, printed and just hand it out for free to new families, um, a lot of times that will be a really big help to them and it won't cost you much. Um, but over and over when you're doing research, uh, new homeschoolers are told hey, if you need to save money, you can use the public library. Or, uh, you know, if you don't have a computer at home, you can, you can use the public library. You know, you can homeschool uh, for just a little money, and you can use the free resources at the library. So, um, so when the homeschoolers come in here, you know, they kind of expect a lot. You know, they're, they're already engaged, and they already view the library as helpful in their mind. And so when they walk in, they're expecting uh, to have a positive interaction. Um, <laughs> okay, I don't know, I forgot to Google kudzu in Kentucky, but uh, we have kudzu in Alabama everywhere. And uh, yes, okay, Charlie, you have it. Well, uh, kudzu is, um, it has some good uses, but uh, it just is so friendly. It just takes over anywhere that it's at. So, um, you know, sometimes I feel like that little building there covered with kudzu after we've had a lot of homeschool families in the library that day. Um, you know, you feel all kind of beat up. But, um, but anyway, I refer to the kudzu effect. Uh, and that's a joke. It's kind of a joke, um, and I joke with my families here. But uh, I, sometimes you just feel like uh, when the homeschooling family comes in, they come in as a group, and they'll just kind of take over the front desk. They all have a question at the same time. You know, uh, they have books, and, you know, they want to bring back or they want to recheck or whatever. And so it can be pandemonium for just a few minutes there. Um, and I, I tell you, you just have to keep your sense of humor handy. You really do. Um, so just remember the kudzu effect the next time. Yes, Malta, it, it really can be. And um, to be honest, I, I kind of freak out when there's a big group at the front desk all at once. So we're going to talk later about some things that you can do to make your interaction with the homeschooling families more positive um, just by preparing ahead and being a little bit proactive with your planning. So we'll, we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. 
Um, so I'm a late bloomer. You know, after I finished uh, homeschooling my kids and I got them into high school, um, I decided to go back to school myself. And so, Sonia, I'm, I'm so distracted. Wow, a laundry basket of books. Now, that, that's really using that laundry basket fully, I'll tell you. Um, I bet they drug it in, too. Um, so when I was in grad school at Alabama and I was working on my master's, um, over and over I run into negative perceptions of homeschoolers, and I've got to be completely transparent with you. Um, even I have negative perceptions sometimes. You see them coming in and you immediately go, oh, oh here they come, you know. So uh, this led me to a really cool research project that I did, and I worked on it uh, for a couple of semesters. I did some intense research on uh, why librarians have negative perceptions of home educators. And so this slide is really just an academic summary of my findings. So we're just going to move on. But um, my professors at Alabama thought it was pretty interesting as well. And, um, and so I tried to isolate what homeschoolers want and then uh, isolate uh, some of the things that can cause a negative perception and then ways to be proactive, you know, in order to have a positive interaction. So. Um, I would ask you, are you on good terms with your local school? Um, if not, evaluate any factors that are prohibiting collaboration with the schools, and you need to work on that as well. Uh, maybe you would have a stakeholder meeting. Uh, here I meet with uh, different community members and uh, different members of the school system, and we try to look at the upcoming year and anticipate some needs and, and make sure that we have some things on hand to support the K-12 school system. Um, the bottom line is uh, that serving the K-12 population as a whole, as a whole now, that is within your mission as a public library. So if you're going to serve K-12 as a whole, then you can break down into subgroups, but you need to make sure that you're actually providing services for every group of students, not just one group. Um, if, you, if you favor one student population over another, then you're really going to miss out on building a trust relationship with your students and their families. Um, and, and the bottom line is all students need the library. And we want all students to trust us and to come to us for help. Homeschoolers generally want um, the same things that other students want. Um, digital services, they like a robust website. They like online and phone reference help. Um, online reservations, they would like. And uh, information sharing uh, with social media. So um, does anybody else, just, just pop a yes up in chat, does anybody else uh, have homeschoolers that like to interact uh, through social media or the website? Mm -hmm. uh, so more and more, even the kids have phones and they can interact, and, and so it becomes the habit to just reach out. You know, you can just reach out. Uh, you don't need to make an appointment or drive. You can just reach out digitally and try to get your information. Um, so, yeah, our local, I don't believe our local groups here have a Facebook page, but they do have an organized group. Um, and they and they're pretty active on our Facebook page. They'll you know they'll like things and share things and um, tag photos and things like that. So it's really helpful. Um, as far as the online reservations, um, they have asked for that for a long time, as as well as other patrons have too. But we just don't have the staff that could handle that sort of request. So we still require the patron to either request in person or, or over the phone if they want to reserve an item. But that's just because we're small and we don't have the time to do it. Um, 
another list of wants that homeschoolers have at the library facility, they like group tours. Uh, they like events during school hours, free meeting space, and free classes and workshops. And what they'll do is they'll take what you're doing and they'll work that into their lesson plans. And that's perfectly fine. Um, where you want to, to really think carefully, um, if they start requesting specific things to meet their curriculum needs, then you want to really uh, think about that and uh, remember that you know we we provide library services and so we plan our topics and our programs in advance and so um, we we're experts in that so we do our own planning and we pick our own topics and then um, you know and then they can just decide if they want to attend or not so um, you know just remember you want to plan ahead and you don't want to get to the point where somebody can call you up and say hey, can you give us a program on so-and-so in two days? You know, because uh, then that gets to be reactive instead of proactive, and that will create a negative relationship right there. Um, all right, uh, some of my parents have requested extended due dates, special borrowing privileges, and a lot of interlibrary loans. When I did my research, I actually found that this is pretty common with all uh, homeschooling families. And uh, it's simply because, you know, they're dealing with a lot of items at once, usually, and, um, and they don't want to owe fines. And so just tracking that many items and, uh, and getting them returned on time can be a challenge. So, you know, hey, they want the extended due dates and, and special borrowing privileges. Um, so what you have to do is you have to look at your library's policy and, um, and you decide, is this a policy that you can fairly offer to everyone um, or does it, does, it, uh, does it detract from the policy that's on, on the books? So um, what I do, when somebody asks for something, um, I've got a little pink slip and I'll, I'll write their request on the pink slip and then I'll make sure that I get their phone number and then I tell them that I'll, I'll uh, research and I'll follow up with them by phone. And so that gives me a little bit of time to really think about whether I can do something or not because when they're standing there in front of you and they have that, that smiling face and those sweet little children and they ask for something, you want to say yes, you know, but you really need to think, um, about some things before you just say yes. So I always ask myself, you know, I always try to give myself a little planning time before I make a decision. Um, Malka, hmm, treat them like bookmobile patrons. That's interesting. Um, hmm, I would like to know more about that. I'm, I'm responding to Malta's uh, chat. And I think that's very interesting. We don't have bookmobiles around here anymore, but the neighboring county does. Huh. Extended due dates. Okay. Well, that's cool. Um, all right. So let's just move on a little bit. Uh, do you love your homeschoolers? We love our homeschoolers. We really do. But they can make you sweat, right? They can really make you work. So... Um, I would ask you, are you a glass half full kind of librarian? I hope so. Being busy is a great indication that your library is relevant in your community, and that's a good thing. Um, and I want to say this carefully. Librarians are often overwhelmed by the robust interactions with homeschoolers. Families often come in together, and they hit the front desk simultaneously with many requests. This is difficult for libraries with limited staff. So you can talk with homeschooling parents and you can work out a routine with them um, that can reduce your stress and it can in increase the engagement with the homeschoolers while they're there. So we'll get to that in another slide. Uh, right now, Let's look at negative perceptions of some U.S. librarians. And I'm not saying that all librarians have these perceptions, but the research shows that these are the common ones that many librarians have. They, uh, they claim that they're concerned with excessive use. 
uh, aka the kudzu effect, <laughs> and also checking out, you know, they'll clean out what you have on a particular subject or whatever. So uh, concerns with excessive use, uh, inadequate staffing or funding, and then attempted censorship uh, or control of the collection. Okay, number one, let's look at that. Concerns with excessive use, the kudzu effect. Okay, the glass half full librarian would say a busy library is a relevant library, so that's good. Okay, so you just got to, you know, think like that. Number two, inadequate staffing or funding, that really can be a problem. Um, you need to track your usage, keep data. Um, you can even uh, map out your foot traffic on specific days of the week or during specific hours and use that to advocate for more staff. If you throw up an Excel spreadsheet with some charts and you can show um, that you have one librarian working and that she has to serve 30 people in an hour, you might get a little more money, you know, from your funding body. So it's, you know, something that you need to do is uh, keep up with your stats. The attention censorship, um, the attention censorship is not a big deal. We live in America. We have free speech. Um, I think it's great. I, you know, I get challenges from time to time, and that's fine. There again, you want to take that challenge. You, you want some time to think about it. So, you know, um, if somebody challenges something, you, you don't have to def defend or make a definitive position on the spot, but, you know, just embrace it. Um, and it, it's just a way to interact with your patron, whoever they are. Um, the thing, um, the thing that that can happen is uh, sometimes you have you might have someone that wants to tell you how to decorate your children's room, or um, you know, or which books to feature in book displays and things like that. And so, I would not automatically say yes or automatically say no. I always always take time to think about things. And the homeschoolers know that when they want when they want something, I'm open to hear it. They come in my office or they catch me, um, you know, in the main floor, and um, and so they they're free to tell me what they want. And I always tell them, I think that's an interesting idea. Let me think about it, and then we'll meet again to discuss it. And so if you do that, um, you know, you can really work well with the homeschoolers and it also gives you a chance if you ever have to say no and we don't like to say no but sometimes we have to but if you ever have to say no it gives you a chance to explain more about your library so that they can understand why you can't do what they're asking you to do um, for instance I had a young lady that needed uh, she needed five books for a research project and they were all on a really unusual topic and so, you know, I had to kind of walk her through the budget of how much I have to spend per month on books. And then um, from that, we looked at what her books would cost and, you know, what that percentage of my budget would be. And so, you know, we, we were able to come to an arrangement where uh, I said, you know, you can pick, why don't you pick one book that you really need for your project and I'll put it in my collection. And, and I want you to pick the book that you think would benefit the community the most. And then these other books, we can try to borrow something uh, to meet those needs. And so, you know, we kind of walk, worked through that, and I thought that was a really good experience. Um, Charlie, how are we doing? You're doing great. Um, not quite halfway, so you're, you're doing great. Sounds good. Plenty of time. <laughs> it's so weird just to talk into a void. It is so yeah. weird. I wish I, I wish I could see you all. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about positive engagement. Um, this is a picture of students from public, private, and home schools, and they meet on the second Monday each month at Thomasville Public Library for a middle school book club. Um, you, you, you know, they're just all mixed in there together, and, uh, and as you can see, we have to meet in our kitchen. We don't have a meeting room, so we meet in the kitchen. And we have a good time. Um, yeah, you know, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth chatted that she, she liked the idea of showing them the budget. Um, and you know what 
that did for that student as well, uh, it gave her an inside look at a budget and a nonprofit and how an administrator has to work within certain limits. And, um, you know, I think she really learned a lot from the whole experience. And, um, and we, you know, we, our relationship is even better now. So um, I look on every interaction as just a chance to further engage the patron. And I love saying yes. And that, that's actually my philosophy here at this library. I tell everybody, um, say yes if you can. If there's any way you can do what the patron needs you to do, do it. But, um, but sometimes, you know, you can't always do that. So anyway, um, I, I just love talking through things and kind of uh, giving them a little perspective on, you know, my side of the desk. So, um, but we have a really good book club that comes in and the kids all get along well together. Okay, positive engagement. Um, these are ways to improve your engagement. Um, librarians are often overwhelmed by the interactions of homeschoolers when they come in. Um, so what you want to do is um, think through the whole process and make sure that you have a clear and consistent policy. Oh, uh, Leah, the middle school group meets on Mondays. Fridays in Thomasville are pretty dead. Friday afternoons are pretty dead. So um, we found that Monday afternoon actually worked best for most of the kids. And then, um, you know, if they're in the band or if they play football, you know, Fridays, Thursdays and Fridays are out for them for a good bit of the school year. So, um, so for this community, Monday works really well for the meetings. Um, Tuesdays are okay, and then the rest of the days don't work well at all after school. So um, you just have to kind of try some things out on different days and figure out what works. But um, for whatever reason, you know, in Thomasville, Monday and Tuesday is about our best choices. Um, okay, but if you're so if you're if you're you, you will get a lot of requests from your homeschooling parents. Can you do this? Can you, you know, can I check this out longer? Can I have more than three? Can I have, so think through your policy. If you're constantly having to change your policy or break your policy in order to meet your patron's needs, then look at your policy and rewrite it. Um, and then you just need to clearly and consistently apply the policy to everyone because you don't want to play favorites because if you play favorites with your homeschoolers, then who are you going to offend? Possibly the public school families that would like to get uh, equal consideration. So think about your policy. Make sure your policy works for you uh, and make sure that you know your policy. And then it's up to you to communicate your policy just as I mentioned with the budget, you know, I walked the student through what would happen if I, you know, purchased her five books that month. Um, in the same way, um, you, as long as you can explain your policy and and how you, you know, that you are fair and consistent, and so you can kind of get them on your side. Um, staff training is very important, and a balanced approach to programming. Um, we'll talk more about that. Okay, so um, homeschoolers ask for a lot here. I'm, I'm, I hate to lump every homeschooler in and say that they're doing the same thing because that's simply not true. But um, the fact is the homeschoolers love the library, and we love the homeschoolers. So they treat us more like family than like a government institution. So um, they really do ask for a lot of things, but it's because they're so comfortable with us that they feel that they can ask us for things. Um, but I have found that they're very, that they understand budgets and staff time, you know, and we can walk them through that if we need to. Um, but I would say always communicate your policy with courtesy and keep the ball rolling. If someone asks you something or they, or they make a comment or a suggestion or, or a request, um, do as much as you can, but remember that it's not possible to say yes to every request. And likewise, 
you should not just say no to every request either. Um, you need to think about it. So when in doubt, think it out. That's a really good phrase to remember. When in doubt, think it out. Um, give yourself a little time if you need to think about it and get their phone number and follow up with them later. Ask yourself, is this within our policy? And ask yourself, if I do this for one student subgroup, can I offer something similar to the other student group? Um, <laughs> because Debbie's wrote a workshop, be careful who you're nice to, they will tell on you. Yes, if you do something nice for someone and they'll talk it up and then you're obligated to do the same thing for others. So um, sometimes some of my coworkers, they'll ask me, can, I'd like to do this or that. And you, you hate to rain on their parade because it's a great idea, but it needs to be scaled down maybe. So I, I always say, okay, so you want to do you want to do this for the that third grade classroom, okay? Well, there's four third grade classrooms in all, and then you know there's 800 kids in the elementary school. Can you do this for every one of them as well? Because when this teacher starts bragging about this program, the other teachers are going to want the same thing. And she was like. Oh my goodness, I see what you're saying. So, you know, you just have to kind of uh, think long term and, and, and think about all of your population groups. And uh, you don't want to do too much for the homeschoolers if you can't do something similar for the, uh, the kids that are in public and private schools as well. Um, all right, I'm a Winston Churchill fan. I like to really plan things out. Um, so, Always avoid reactive programming. It can only lead to negative interactions. Um, sometimes we get overworked and we're really busy. And if you if you pop out a response or uh, or something in in response to a request, if you pop that out really quickly, it can come out in the wrong way. And you don't mean it that way, but maybe you're tired, or maybe. Um, your short staff that day, or maybe you have a, a problem going on at home and you just don't have as much patience as you normally would. So the kindest thing you can do for yourself and for your patrons is to plan ahead as much as possible. And if you're ever unsure of the, of the right thing to do for a patron, if they're asking for something that's a little bit different and you're not sure if you want to do it or not, don't, you know, don't slam the door in their face, but just say, hey, you know, I think that's really interesting. Let me think about that, and then can I call you, and we can talk more. And if you do that, then they learn to trust you. They learn to give you their ideas and their needs, and they'll trust you to do as much as you can, um, you know. Um, all right. So I don't know how your community is, but here, um, we have to walk a tightrope because if we do too much for one group, it, it will alienate another group. Um, some libraries do too much, some may not do enough, but remember to offer equitable access to materials and services for all. All right, look at the zebra walking the tightrope there. Okay, so in order to improve your positive engagement with K-12 students and their families, these are things to think about. Consider your budget and your staff time, not just the money spent on a book or the money spent to buy supplies for a program. Always think about the staff time that you are putting in. Um, and it's a good idea to, to do that. Uh, anytime you're planning a program or something for students, um, track that because um, you'll be surprised at how much you're investing in a program when you count staff time. Uh, also ask yourself, if I do this for this group of students, can I do something similar for other groups of students? Special events don't cater to your homeschoolers or you will alienate the other student groups in your community. And last but not least, when in doubt, think it out. Uh, my favorite saying. Okay. so. I've got an example here, and I just want to give you some food for thought, and I'm, I'm, 
I am not saying, you know, that this is the way to do something, but it, it, it's always a good idea to, to throw things on a spreadsheet and to see what's really going on sometimes. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth wrote, what do you do when your homeschool families become too comfortable with your staff? That is a toughie, but I would assign them some tasks when they come in. Uh, if they're going to be hanging around and all in your space, you might as well put them to work. So I would come up with a little scheme so that uh, when the kids come in, I had some kids that would come in and I would give them dusting cloths and uh, they would go around and dust the bookshelves to help me. Um, I did that simply to give them something to do. You know, they wanted to help and um, I, I really didn't want them under my feet. Um, but I didn't, you know, I just thought it was really sweet, so I found something that they could do. Uh, older kids and parents, um, I teach them to check items in and out, and I let them help out at the front desk while they're there. Um, and so that helps me, and it, it, it makes them feel important uh, and useful. And I think we all like to feel important and useful. Um, okay, so in this example, uh, five, let's look at a $5,000 budget, and we have 1,000 staff hours. And we're going to divide that amongst my student population of 2,325. If you do the math um, and you break it down, uh, the 1,600 public school students would get the bulk of your budget, the private school students would get their fair share, and the homeschool students um, would get a very small amount if you used this formula. Now, the homeschool students are a smaller group, but more of them routinely and robustly use my library, so they feel like a lot more. Um, so I'm going to show you how you can actually use your budget, and you can uh, you can serve all the students with your most of your budget, and in in doing so, you can actually do more for the smaller subgroups than you would be able to do if you if you just took the math and you did the percentages and divided it out like that. Um, all right, here's my staff, and that's not, everyone in that picture is not my staff. Um, we were doing a workshop that day, so we had uh, a trainer there and we had a couple of people there that were just sitting in. But um, anyway, the sta your staff is the key. And if you are the staff, then you have a tough job. If you have a really small library and, and you're the main person at the desk, um, my hats go off to you because uh, you do an incredible job there. Um, but staff development, okay, everybody might not love the homeschoolers as much as you do, okay? So how are we going to teach the staff to be consistent and to interact in the right way with the homeschoolers. Well, you have to do staff training. Uh, you have to make sure that any full-time staff is completely on board with your vision for customer service, and they have to they have to mentor and role play for uh, part-timers or new staff members. And I discovered this uh, through someone that was hired um, at the library. Not everyone smiles and makes eye contact when they're dealing with people, uh, but I think that that should be required when you're doing public service at the library. So um, if you look at any books on librarianship, the basic reference interview, it, it walks you through the steps of how to give a really good reference interview. And it includes you start off with a smile, you make eye contact, you have positive body language, you ask neutral questions, and you assist the patron. Okay, so if you have someone and they're not, they're really not uh, getting your vision for serving students, especially the homeschool students and their families, then um, it really is okay to go through some staff training and to require them to follow the good practices for offering reference help at a library. So maybe they're not the most social person in the world, but if you're working with someone and they're not nice at the front desk, that can torpedo your program. 
And so you need to really train everyone to have good customer service and you need to require that they that they um, display good customer service. So they no no frowny faces at the front desk, you know. Um, all right, so if the staff is trained and they're all ready for the homeschooling families when they come in, then you're going to see a lot of smiles. On the left, that's uh, just, actually, that's just two families on the left, uh, and that's not all their kids. But when they come in, they're so happy to be there. And they have a wide range of ages coming in. And so we, have, we look forward to seeing them. They come into our story hours. We enjoy it. Um, here's something. All right, I, I said earlier, you know, you can prepare for the families that come in with a with a laundry basket of books for you to deal with or whatever. So here's what we do. Um, we have a special protocol that we use uh, on on certain days when most of the families come in. So. Uh, we train our families to work with us. There again, it's like talking about your budget. We talk with them, and we're like, you know, we love to see y'all come in, but it, it kind of stresses me out when you have, you know, three of your kids are trying to ask about different books all at the same time, and I get your books mixed up because I don't know which ones are being returned and which ones are being checked out, and, you know, and on. So, you know, you just talk with them, and you say, why don't we work out something where we could? I could teach one of your older children to do your checkouts for your family. Would y'all like to do that? That would be fun. And they'll say, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, and they'll name off one of their kids. They would love to do that. They're very responsible. So, um, so I say create a self-check station if you have a really small staff and train your family to check their own items out. You are not going to have to worry about anybody uh, deliberately taking things without checking them out, um, that's just not, that's not a problem here. Um, but think about that, all right? So if they had their own checkout station and they were involved in the process of checking their own things out and making sure that the due date was right and stamping the items, it is like putting them in your shoes so that they understand what it's like to process a large number of materials in a short amount of time. So number one, it's going to make them more sympathetic to you, right, and more considerate of you because they know how it is when you have a lot of stuff to do in a short period of time. So, you know, I, I know some people don't like doing the self-check thing, but I promise you it works. Uh, the families will do their own work, and um, they will actually uh, be more organized uh, once they're involved in the process. So. Um, so we set up a reception desk. We have a certain area on story hour day. We have a certain area. It's a little book cart. We keep it empty. And when they come in, they're told to drop their items off as they're coming into story hour. Okay? And they all put their items, their book bags, on the cart. And when story hour starts, we roll the cart to the front desk. We check everything in, and we roll it back over there. Now, we ask them, hey, when you get books ready to check out, put them in your empty bag and put it back on the cart. And we do the same thing at the end of story hour. All at one time, we roll the bags over, we check everything out, we put it back in each bag. Um, so we're basically doing all of the check-ins at one time, all of the checkouts at one time. And the families learn the routine and they work with us um, to kind of segment the process out to make it easier on the staff. We also keep little pink slips at the front desk with pens, and we tell them when you come in, if you have uh, some special requests or you need to ask about some items or anything like that, write your request on the pink slip and leave it here. And as soon as the librarian gets a minute, she'll go through the pink slips one by one and she'll address them, you know, as she gets time while you're here. Because we have a whole hour, you know, while they're at story hour, we have a whole hour. Um, to take care of things. So what we try to do is to get them to, to, to do things on our time schedule, and that just makes it more enjoyable for us, you know? So 
um, overall, you need to protect your broad mission to serve a diverse population. Okay, everybody in your community is depending on your library for uh, fair access to information. So for this reason, um, you just have to include all of your student subgroups, not just your homeschoolers in your planning. Um, this is a third grade class that came and visited our library a couple of years ago, and they had such a good time. Um, I'll tell you, 10 years ago, we didn't have tours at our library much from students. Um, I don't think we did such a good job of engaging the students. And so uh, that's become a priority, and we've worked harder and harder to, uh, to engage the K-12. And, and now um, we have really robust interactions with the homeschoolers. And we have a public and a private school uh, in the area. So we have really robust interactions with both of those other uh, school groups. And I have found this is the coolest thing. Um, if you balance your services among all of your student groups and you plan most of your group activities for after regular school hours, then all of the students in your area will learn to to trust the library and they will think you're important and you will be important to them. So uh, while I'm here to talk about serving homeschoolers, um, at the same time, the, in the big picture for your community, you need, to, uh, you need to work just as hard to serve all of your students. Not, you know, the homeschoolers, are they come in, they're robust, but they're easy because they like you, you like them. They're very comfortable asking for what they need, but then you've got these other groups of students that are a little scared when they come in the library. Are they scared of the mean library lady? Huh. Well, that seems to be the case sometimes, but, <coughs> pardon me. But anyway, um, so what you want is you want, to, um, you want to foster relevancy for every student in your population area, in every group. Um, okay, Julie has typed in a question. She wants to know how do you justify to your board and other public to spend more time on homeschoolers? Do you have a chart of how you break down your budget more evenly? Um, well, I don't break the budget down for my board, um, but I will tell you, you know, for he here I have to walk the line because uh, most of my board is retired educators, and so. Um, I can see the concern on their face sometimes when they come during traditional school hours and we have older kids in here that are doing activities. So um, we have actually uh, moved most of our activities after three on school day. Now for the early literacy activities like story hour, we do meet, um, we have uh, a morning and an afternoon story hour. But um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I've got a little um, my allergies in Alabama. Uh, but anyway, it, it's a difficult topic, and it's really hard for me to talk about this, even you know, in the, in this sort of an environment, because um, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I I really love and support my homeschooling uh, population, but the thing is. Um, it's easy to do stuff for them, and it, it becomes really easy to plan activities that they will come to during school hours. But the thing that you have to really start thinking about is, okay, so if I'm having uh, a one-hour activity every Wednesday at 10 o'clock, and they're coming to it, and you, you say to yourself, this is a successful activity, they are coming to this, okay, that is one way to look at success, but another thing that you need to do is ask yourself, if I took a program to the public school at 10 o'clock on a Wednesday, would kids come to, to that program? Yes, they would. You can also ask yourself, if I offered to uh, have the kids come here on a bus and do a program at 1 o'clock during the day, would they come? Yes, they would. So it's not a matter of students not wanting to use your library. 
Um, some students just can't come during those hours, and the homeschooler uh, families like to get their activities done earlier in the day, so they will ask for activities during uh, school hours. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, we do some activities during school hours, but for us, um, in order to be relevant to everyone in the community, and our public school system is pretty large here compared to our population, so in order to be relevant, and to meet the needs of everyone. We, we have worked it out so that we do things after school and all of the students come to it, even the homeschool students. So um, it, it, we, we do very well here to mix the, the students together. Um, all right, Julie writes, in my county, there are several different homeschool groups. I have not been successful in getting them to come to programs during the school day. Any suggestions? Hmm. I would send them a flyer. I would make up like a little PR flyer and I would send it to them. Um, also, if you have any social media, um, you could you could you can design a flyer and publisher and you can save it as a JPEG and pop it up on your Facebook page pretty easy. And so you could uh, pop up a, a flyer in JPEG on Facebook and you could tag them on the photos so that the parent gets the flyer, uh, they're tagged in a photo on Facebook. That's what I would do. Um, and then if you if you just list a basic uh, topic that you're going to be doing and things like that, uh, a lot of homeschoolers will work that into their lesson plans if they know ahead of time. So if you plan your programs, uh, say, a month in advance, then you could just send them a general. I mean, it doesn't have to be detailed, but you could say we're going to be studying um, you know, insects on this day, and we're going to look at rockets on this day, and we're going to, and then, you know, it would be up to them to kind of work that in. Um, okay, uh, Sarah Beth wants to know specific programs that we do with homeschoolers. Um, all right, let me pop through here. We do, we allow homeschoolers to volunteer to help us with projects, and um, uh, that's actually quite a service to the homeschoolers as well. Uh, we do get something out of it, but uh, they also get some experience, some good volunteer experience on their resume, and uh, we love to get their input. All right, so what do we do for homeschoolers? Well, this slide shows what we do for all students, and I encourage everybody to, uh, to take a computer this afternoon and to outline what you're doing for students right now, and then you can break it down and you can kind of clearly see if you're doing too much or not enough. Um, but for us, like I said, our budget is small, our staff is small, and our building is small. So we put the bulk of our time into programs that all students can benefit from, which means um, they're either self-serve or they're after traditional school lets out. So um, we have extended hours. We make sure our computers have up-to-date software that the kids need to do their homework in. Um, we provide study space and the books that uh, cover topics that most students need research on. We offer staff help, including computer assistance. Um, and then we, we did extend our renewal policy and our book checkout limit. Um, based on requests from parents, but we offer this to everybody, not just students. They can renew most items three times, and they can check out up to 35 books on a card. Okay? So um, another thing, uh, programs and services during non-school hours, uh, book clubs meet at 3.30 on Mondays, and that's for third through the 12th grade. And then we do other events um, as they come up, uh, and in, for like Team Read Week, we do things in the library and we do things at the schools and it all coordinates together. But uh, our summer program is huge here. We have uh, over 300 children and teens that will sign up for our summer program. And, uh, and we'll, we'll actually engage over 200 kids to read throughout the summer. So I think that's really, really cool. Um, and it shows that the students, you know, like us, trust us, and we're reaching the students. So that's important. Um, the by appointment in the bottom right of the slide, um, we offer this to all students. They can volunteer, they can request a volunteer to get community service hours. 
I can set up a tour. We can do workshops for them. Um, all they have to do is set it up ahead of time, and I offer that to traditional teachers. I offer that to parent homeschoolers, etc. So I apply that consistently to everybody. It's available to everybody by appointment. All right. Break down what you're doing. Look at what you do that's special that you do for one group and not another. I created a chart. Um, I was getting a lot of looks and questions from my board. You know, oh, you're, you know, you have a lot of older kids that are attending at your story hour and things like that, and you don't. And I, so, I thought, now I need a way to advocate to my educating to my education board members um, that I. I'm doing things for the city schools, but I have to do different things for them that works for them. And then I, I single out the Boys and Girls Club, and I have a special program that reaches the 100 kids that are there. And then, you know, and so I created a list of what I'm doing specifically for the city school system, specifically for the Boys and Girls Club and for the homeschooled students. I keep this list handy. I'll look at it from time to time, and I will update it. And that way, I'm a ready advocate. When somebody questions, am I doing too much for the homeschool students? Or what, well, what are you doing for the school kids? You know, I've got this in my head, and I can, I can easily advocate, hey, we, we're doing this for the city schools, you know, and we're doing, we're doing this specifically for them, and nobody else gets, gets these services. So it's just a way to communicate. I'm sure you're being fair. And I'm sure you're doing the best you can, but it never hurts to put it on paper and kind of divide it out. And, and, and that way you're ready when somebody asks you about it. Um, notice in red in that right-hand column, we have a story hour twice on Thursday. So it's for three- and four-year-olds, but we allow students up through second grade to fill the empty seat. And so this is something special that we do for the homeschool students during school hours, okay? Um, so it would be senseless to have vacant seats and not allow the older students in, but our, our priority for that program is to enroll the younger kids in the early literacy programs, but we do allow the older homeschool kids in there, and we allow them to volunteer when they get too old to attend. Um, Perks for teachers, yes, we offer perks for teachers, um, but we uh, we actually were called out on this in social media. We put this little flyer up there, and immediately the same day, one of my homeschooling parents uh, commented under the flyer and said, is this available to homeschooling parents also? Okay, and so I, I said, sure. I mean, you know, three days grace on overdues, a fine cap, um, they can renew five times instead of three times, and I give them uh, one free card a year for the parent or for the teacher. So, you know, I thought, can I do this consistently for everyone that's teaching in a home, private, or public school? And the answer to me is yes, I can do this. So I offered it to everyone to be consistent, you know. Um, and so that way the staff doesn't have to remember all these little intricate rules and stuff. If they, I basically said, hey, if they walk in and they say they're a teacher, you just give them a free card. Um, and we do that for uh, adjacent counties as well for educators. So, um, all right. And there's a slide of where my library is headed. Um, we have this old building downtown that we're going to renovate and we're going to expand it and we will be in a new facility in about two years, I hope. Um, all right, so that's gonna that's gonna pretty much wrap up uh, what I have to say. Um, you got my slides. I just encourage you to put on paper and on spreadsheets what you're currently doing for your different student populations. And I think once you get everything on there, remember cataloging time. If you're doing if you're cataloging for the accelerated reading program at your local school, that's a service you're doing for that school system. Okay. So keep everything down on paper and pat yourself on the back because once you put down everything that you're doing and every bit of staff time that you're investing for your K-12 students, you're going to say to yourself, wow, I'm doing a lot. You know, I'm doing a good job. So 
Um, but if you find that one list is very short and, and maybe you're doing a whole bunch, maybe you're spending 10 staff hours a month on homeschool programs, then you've got to ask yourself, am I meeting the needs of the, of the kids that are in a traditional school setting? And, um, you know, just try to keep things in balance. Remember the zebra that's walking on the tightrope and keep things in balance. Um, and if there's any area where you feel like you're lacking, then come up with a, a one-year plan to try to improve that and then just keep doing that until you bring that area in line with the other, with the other program areas that you have. Um, all right, Charlie, I think I'm done. Uh, I know Charlie did say that the slides would be up and available to print. Yes, they um, are. I'm going to change the screen real quick over, and that will give everybody the chance to download the um, slides. They're down there in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, and the instructions cool. on how to, how to download them are on that slide there, along with Gina's contact information. Um, and just to give everybody a chance to type in any final questions, just a reminder um, that I'll be emailing you all out a certificate of attendance, as well as a link to a survey about this training. And Gina, we did have one final question come in there while you were wrapping up. And if anybody else has any questions, please go ahead and chat them in. Um, but Julie uh, asked, oh, asked about oh, that's a contacting question. homeschooling families. Um, finding them and contacting them. Um, it depends. It depends on what the laws are in your state. For us, um, everything has to be done through a church school. And so uh, you can reach out to the churches. Um, Homeschool Legal Defense Association has a website that breaks things down by state. And if you're interested in finding the homeschoolers in your area, they actually list some contacts on their website. And I would encourage you to email them and, and ask them for suggestions on finding your local homeschoolers in order to provide services to them. And you said that was called Homeschool Legal Defense Foundation? Yeah, I popped that in the chat. Oh, they're, good. They're Thank very you. reputable. Yeah, and that's strictly, they're, they're from a political and a legal aspect. You can go to that site and you can look up uh, issues by state. You can look up laws and requirements and also hot topics. Um, so if you wanted to know if there are any, anything going on in the Kentucky legislature that, that is of interest to homeschoolers, you could find it there. You know? But they've been around a long time. Thank you, guys. I really enjoyed the talk. I wish I could have uh, met with you face-to-face, -face, but this has been good. And if anybody has questions, feel free to just uh, email me. And check us out on social media, um, and you can kind of see what we're up to there as well. So, OK. And I want to just say thank you, Leah, for sending that note about Michelle. I'll take care of that. Um, thank you so much, Gina, for um, sharing your time with us today and your busy day. <laughs> and <laughs> you shared some really great information with us. I, I know it was appreciated. And you definitely sound like an expert on this topic, so we appreciate that. Well, I w one final thought. I was speaking with a homeschooling mom the other day, and I told her I was doing this presentation again. And I told her, uh, you know, I said one of the biggest compliments that you can pay your homeschoolers is to treat them as a valid educational movement. Um, so if you start thinking of them as the same, you know, they're just a subgroup of your K-12 students, just like the public school and the private schools are. Um, they're a subgroup and they're a valid educational movement. They don't really need special treatment, um, but they are unusual and they can you know, you can do some different types of programming with them. But if you just basically treat them the same and serve them uh, uh, just in a, in a balanced way the, uh, as you would the other student groups, you'll find that over time they actually feel more validated uh, by your services. Um, and she agreed with me. She said, you know, you treat us just like you do everybody else, and we really appreciate that. So That is that's great advice. All right. Well, thank you all very much for attending today, Gina. Thanks again for sharing sharing this with us. We really do appreciate it. Thank you, Charlie. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.